Hey all, today we're going to talk about uh, gathering data some more and this time we're going to talk about some other ways. We've talked about uh, surveys and census. Um, today we're going to start talking about observational studies and experiments. So we'll start with observational studies. So uh, this is an example of an observational study back in 2007. Um, cats and dogs were developing kidney failure and dying. And so researchers didn't know why, and so they wanted to look into that. And so what they had to do was an observational study. It is a way to collect data where we are not controlling any factors involved um, in what's happening. We're just sort of collecting data, getting information, um, and then trying to draw some conclusions. So furthermore, uh, in that example where the, the dogs and cats were getting kidney failure, so what they did was they went and they talked to the pet owners of those pets that were sick. And they asked, they, they asked them questions about their diet, um, if they may have been exposed to toxins and other things that they think may have caused this kidney failure. And so this was called a retrospective observational study. It's retrospective because um, the, th the thing that they're uh, interested in has already happened. So the cats and dogs have already had kidney failure. And so they're going and they're getting information from those subjects, um, past records, or in this case, uh, uh, past information that uh, might give them something about uh, why they were having kidney failure. The other type of observational study is a prospective observational study. So this is where the thing you're studying hasn't happened yet. You select the people you want to participate and then you collect data over time. So you, um, you observe over time. So retrospective means you're going back and collecting data on something that already happened. Prospective is where you are collecting data kind of as it's happening. And again, in an observational study, the uh, researchers don't have any control over what's happening. They're not trying to influence what's happening. They're just trying to collect information on what's happening so that they might draw some conclusions. Uh, did I have some more here? So I want you to pause here, read this. This is in the book. I think it's number eight, something like that, but it's right here for you. So pause here, read this through, and then we'll talk about deciding whether it was retrospective or prospective. All right, so this study was actually kind of like uh, uh, observational study inception. So they actually, the researchers actually looked at three observational studies that already occurred. Um, one that took place across the United States, one that took place in Baltimore, and then one that took place in Eugene, Oregon. So the, those studies were probably prospective studies. They selected the students and then they collected data on them over time. Um, this study, where they looked at all three of these observational studies, was retrospective because they were looking at something that already happened. And uh, they were trying to make connections about things um, like uh, mental health and attendance and uh, other things. Um, those things already happened. So the students already uh, went through the original study and then these researchers took all three of those and did their own study. So this would be a retrospective. They're looking at something that already happened. So pause here again. This one's a little bit shorter. <clears throat> pause here again and decide if it's retrospective or prospective. So this example would be a prospective observational study. Uh, they selected these 200 men and women, and then they uh, took their blood pressure and they gave them a memory test. 
And so, again, they're not influencing these people's blood pressure. Um, they're just simply gathering that information. What is their blood pressure? And they said that uh, they have moderately high blood pressure. And then they're giving them a memory test. And they're, they're making some connections, drawing some conclusions. They haven't influenced this at all. They haven't influenced whether or not these people have blood pressure. And it's something that they're actually observing as it's happening. They're not going back and uh, researching these people's history. They're taking their blood pressure, and then they're giving them a memory test. So this is a prospective observational study. The next way we collect data, and, and maybe the most famous way we collect data, is by doing experiments. And so I want to start when we talk about an experiment by saying first, this is the only way, the absolute only way to prove causation. The only way to prove that one thing causes another is to do a randomized experiment. And of course, you must follow the design principles. And so the first principle is you must have control within your experiment. You want to control um, any sources of variation that will affect your results. You also need your experiment to be randomized. We talked a lot about randomly sampling when you're doing a survey. So typically people volunteer to be involved in an experiment. The randomization comes in when you assign them to different treatments or groups. So you randomly assign people to groups and that's where the randomization comes in. You're not really gonna randomly sample people and say, hey, come do this experiment. You get people to volunteer that meet your uh, your experiments criteria for volunteers, and then you'll randomly assign them to groups. So that's, that's what's happened over the last uh, year with these uh, vaccination groups. People have volunteered to be part of the experiment for the vaccine, and they have been randomly assigned to get the vaccine or get uh, a, a fake injection, which we'll talk about later. Uh, you need to be able to replicate your experiments. So you, you can't just experiment on a few people or a few subjects. You need to be able to do this um, on a bigger scale. Um, so again, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you that I don't know the exact number, but I believe that um, the one study for vaccines right now was, was I think, about 30,000 people. So they were able to replicate that experiment a lot of times. So one through three are sort of the things that every experiment must, 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 must have. And then we will talk about blocking next time. But blocking is also um, a good uh, thing to do in experiments and happens a lot. And it helps us account for uh, variation that exists. So we'll talk more about blocking next time. Control, randomization, and replication are the things that must be involved in an experiment for your experiment to be valid. So sometimes we like to uh, sort of lay out what the experimental design looks like, and it can get uh, it can be simple and it can be very complicated depending on the layers of this experiment. And so here we have. Um, this OptiGrow plant fertilizer, and they are saying that if you use our fertilizer, you're going to get juicier and tastier tomatoes. And so uh, researchers want to test to see if that's true. And so they, they perform an experiment. And so here is what uh, sort of a diagram of our experiment looks like. Uh, we we want to control the factors. The factor that we're controlling here is the amount of fertilizer that uh, our tomato plants get. And we've dis the researchers have decided uh, to take that fertilizer and use three levels of the fertilizer. They're going to give some plants none, and that's what we call a control group, where we just grow tomatoes like we normally would. Some of them are going to get a half dose of fertilizer, and then some of them will get a full dose, uh, as recommended, of the fertilizer. 
And so the experimenters get 24 tomato plants. And then they are going to randomly assign their tomato plants. So this is where the random assignment comes in. I take uh, an equal amount of each and put them in the three groups. I'm going to have three groups because I have three treatments. I have my control where I uh, am giving them none of this OptiGrow. I'm just planting the tomatoes and letting them grow like I normally would. Then I have a group where they're getting half dose of the OptiGrow, and then a group where they're getting a full dose of the OptiGrow. And the replication comes in here because we can do, we're doing this eight times in each group. So eight plants are in each group. Eight tomato plants are in the control. Eight tomato plants get the half dose. Eight tomato plants get the full dose. Okay, so our variable is the fertilizer amount, and it has three levels, none, half, and full. And so we'll let those tomato plants grow, and then we'll come back, and we'll compare all of them based on their juiciness and their tastiness. And those are what we call responses. So I want you to pause here, read this one, and we're going we're gonna to draw uh, another example of a experimental diagram. Okay, so we have 130 patients with lacerations, so uh, wounds that they need to have closed. Um, and so they have this one, I'm not going to even try and read that word, I'll say OTA, the super glue. And then they have traditional uh, stitches or sutures. And so we start with these 130 patients. And then we have one variable. The variable here is the, the uh, I, I don't want to say treatment, but I want to say, uh, let's say wound closure method. That's real technical, everybody. You probably would believe I went to med school. So the vari variable is the wound closure method, and then we have uh, two levels of that, or two treatments. And the first one is the, I'll, I'll call it OTA, that super glue, and the other one is sutures. I guess that's the technical term for stitches. Thankfully, I've never had those. So we're going to randomly assign. All right, we're gonna we're we're randomly assigning half the patients to get this OTA method. So um, sixty-five patients will get the OTA, and sixty-five patients will get the sutures. And then we will allow them to heal, uh, depending on how long that takes. We'll allow them to heal, and then they'll come back, and they're going to collect data. And what they collected data on was um, scarring. So they'll come back, and they will compare the scarring. So my son actually got this super glue type stuff when he was younger on his forehead. Um, it was relatively painless. and uh, he has minor scarring, but it worked pretty well. He didn't have to get stitches. So we have random assignment involved here. And we have a control. We have control of what's happening. And this, the sutures would probably be con called the control group because this is the, the traditional method of closing up a wound. And then we have replication. The replication. Uh, comes into play when we, we have 65 patients in each. So we were able to replicate the OTA closing 65 times. We were able to replicate using traditional sutures 65 times. And then uh, at the end, we can compare which method is better in terms of pain. Uh, I guess they compare scarring and pain um, to see which one is maybe the better method.
so that's it for today. I'm going to have a couple questions pop up here for you. Make sure you answer those questions and watch all the way to the end of the video so that you can get your full credit. Any questions you have, please feel free to come to class and ask those.